So this is joint work with Sergei Konyagin. So let me just uh, start with some real basics. So it's a well-known fact that for every natural number n, n plus one divides 2n choose n, the central binomial coefficient. And I'm gonna give you three proofs of this since it's real easy. Uh, the first is that if you just look at the ratio, that's the Catalan number, which is well known to count or enumerate many different combinatorial objects. Uh, just to pick one at random, uh, if you're having an election and uh, two candidates each get N votes and you are counting them, uh, let's say at random, uh, what's the chance that one of the candidates is never trailing during the count? Okay, that's exactly the Catalan number. Or that's actually counting how many ways you can do it. So another proof is you could just Write this as the difference of two binomial expressions. So it's obviously an integer. But the proof I want to emphasize today is a number theoretic proof, which is proof number three. So let's take a prime power that exactly divides n plus one and look at the base p digits of n. And I want the, the final j of them, okay, since p to the j divides n plus one, the final j base, base p digits are all p minus one. So if I add n and n together in base p, that's going to induce j carries using the grade school method of, of, of adding. And then by Coomer's criterion, that means that p to the j must divide two n choose n. Right, so that uh, you apply this for every prime power and you'll see then uh, that the theorem holds. And for those of you who don't remember, so Coomer's criterion, at least applied to the central binomial coefficient uh, means that the power P dividing this or any binomial coefficient is equal to the number of carries when you add uh, N and N base P. So I'm gonna make use of that quite a bit in this talk. All right, so a few years ago, Carl Pomerantz asked the question, given a integer k, how often does n plus k divide 2n choose n? So of course, when k is one, we know it, it's all the time, but for other k, uh, it doesn't seem to be all the time, but at least when K is positive, the answer is pretty easy. Uh, in fact, N plus K will divide two N choose N for almost all N. And I'll give you a sketch of the proof. It's also based on Coomer's criteria. So we'll take a prime power that divides N plus K assume that P is at least 2K, right? That's important because then I wanna look at the final base P digits of N. So the final J of them, uh, it'll be a string of P minus ones and then a P minus K. Now the important thing here is that every one of these digits is at least P over two. And that means when I add N and n base p, I will again have at least j carries and therefore uh, p to the j divides 2n choose n by Coomer's criterion. Okay, so that takes care of the larger prime factors. What about the smaller ones? Well, it's well known and uh, uh, this is probably has a much earlier reference than uh, Carl's paper, but if you take any, say, fixed prime and an exponent which is not too large, then almost all of the central binomial coefficients will be divisible by that prime power. This is regardless of whether P divides N or P doesn't divide N, okay? So for the most part, the central binomial coefficients will be divisible by 
large powers of small primes. And the idea, I can just sketch the proof very quickly. So if P, since P is small, uh, there are something like a constant times log X base P digits. And whether they are larger than P over two or smaller than P over two is about a 50-50 chance if you average over all, uh, all N with say P fixed. Uh, so it's then very rare that you will have uh, so few of them uh, that are larger than p over two. Okay, with with very high probability, you'll have many of them that are larger than p over two. Okay, so this also starts to bring into play probabilistic thinking uh, about the problem. All right, so this takes care of the case when k is positive. And in fact, uh, one can show that not just almost all n, but the, the number of n up to x is something like x plus big O of uh, a smaller power of x. So you can get a power savings very, very easily by uh, making a, a lot of this argument quantitative. Now let's talk about negative values of k or in, including zero. So uh, k less than or equal to zero. So Pomerantz introduced uh, the set, which is just the set of natural numbers with this divisibility condition. And one interesting observation he made is that the set D zero, that is the set with n dividing two n choose n governs all of the others with k negative. And more precisely, if you look at the counting function of dk compared with the counting function of d0, the difference is little o x. Uh, in fact, one can uh, get a power savings here, but where the power depends on k, but uh, little o x is, is good enough for our purposes here. And the proof of this is essentially the same type of argument, again, uh, for large primes, which divide n, basically the power of p dividing 2n choose n and 2n minus k choose n minus k are going to be the same by Coomer's criterion. Uh, the idea is that if you look at the base p digits of n and n minus k, since P divides N, uh, these will be the same except for the very last digit, which is uh, in the case of N, it's, it's a zero. And in the case of N minus K, it's minus K. Okay, recall that K is negative here. So minus K is a, is a positive quantity. And both of these are now smaller than P over two. So there's no carry. Okay, uh, I'm being a little bit loose here. Um, so whether or not there's a carry doesn't, it isn't exactly a function of whether the digit is larger than P over two or smaller. If it's equal to P minus one over two, it may or may not induce a carry depending on uh, what other digits are uh, beyond it, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be a little bit loose about such facts. Um, for p less than 2k, we just use uh, the lemma. So this uh, lemma of Pomerantz that says that the binomial coefficient is divisible by small prime powers almost all the time. Right, so this is the basic idea of why this is true. So now we have reduced the problem to understanding D zero. Okay, and that will be the focus of the rest of the talk, right? So here's some numerical data. So this is again, numbers for which N divides two N choose N. Uh, so the data 
is in certain intervals here. Uh, the second column is the numerical counts. And the last column is the percentage of integers in the interval that have that property. So it seems, uh, you know, I took some intervals starting at one and then I took a, an interval of length 10 to the seventh starting at 10 to the 30th, just to illustrate that the, whatever phenomenon is, is still persisting at that height. So it seems that uh, roughly 12% of integers have this property. And it raises the natural question then, does D0 have positive density? All right. Well, uh, Pomerantz raised this question in his paper from five years ago. He proved that the upper asymptotic density, which I uh, denote by D upper bar of D zero is at most one minus natural log of two, which is about 0 0.3. The proof is very quick because we make the following observation. If you have a prime dividing n, which is larger, a little bit larger than the square root of n, then this will not happen. So you'll have a non-divisibility. And that's because uh, if p is bigger than the square root 2n, then in base p, n will have only two base p digits. And since p divides n, uh, the final digit, the, the second digit is zero. And the first one is less than p over two. And therefore, when you add n with n base p, there's no carry. Okay, so then p divides n, but it doesn't divide 2n choose n. Um, just as an aside, this kind of idea is used uh, can be used to provide estimates for the prime counting function uh, of Chebyshev type. So you can you can use this. This is a, this is a familiar type of proof of uh, Chebyshev's estimates for primes. So uh, based on prime divisors of two n choose n. Okay. So well, what's the density of such integers? The the ones that have such a prime factor? Well, if I write down the density of those without such a prime factor, that is all the prime divisors of n are smaller than square root 2n. Well, that's well known. That's uh, estimates for smooth numbers. And it's given by the Dickman function at 2, which is 1 minus log 2. OK, so that's a pretty simple proof. But of course, this is only uh, primes larger than 2n. There are other intervals of primes that are forbidden, but it's, it's more complicated to, to write those down. Uh, Sana, a few years later, added some more forbidden uh, factorizations uh, and improved Pomerantz's theorem slightly in a numerical sense. Uh, however, this is still quite a bit larger than what we expect the truth is, which is about 12%. So this is about double what we expect. So I want to make a, an observation here, which is an extension of the lemma I referred to uh, of Pomerantz that for most numbers n, 2n choose n is divisible by uh, all the, how to say, small prime powers up to a certain bound. So in our paper, with uh, the paper with Kornyagin, we showed the following uh, quantitative aspect of that. So we take any epsilon of n going to zero arbitrarily slowly. And I'll let a sub n be the end of the epsilon smooth part of n. So it's, it's the 
product of the prime powers dividing n that are uh, smaller than n to the epsilon. Uh, actually, it should be p less than n to the epsilon. Okay, so let's cross out that exponent there. All right, uh, so what we showed then is that a sub n will divide 2n choose n for almost all n. So what does that mean for the, the D0 set? It means that it's essentially for most numbers n, whether or not n divides 2n choose n is determined by the large prime factors of n. So the small ones don't play any role in uh, computing the density. Um, so I'm not going to write down the proof, but it follows very easily from these, these uh, using Coomer's criterion and, and just uh, sort of basic uh, probabilistic ideas. Um, yeah, so we're reduced to the large primes. So now I want to develop a heuristic, which will give you uh, give us at least a guess about what the answer is at least what the density is for d0 so let's take a large prime divisor of n uh, one observation is that uh, since p is large for most numbers n p squared will not divide n so there's only one factor of p that we have to deal with so then what we are interested in is when does P divide 2N choose N? And this is more, like I said, it's more or less equivalent that some base P digit is bigger than P over two. Uh, again, the case where one digit is equal to P minus one over two is a gray area, but if P is large, it's somewhat, it's, it's rather rare for uh, there to be such. So uh, uh, throwing out, let's say, a very small set of ends, uh, this is the criteria that we have to study. Now, if you write n in base p, uh, there are one plus floor log n over log p base p digits. The final one is zero because p divides n. Also, the first digit, that is the leading digit, is going to be smaller than p over two most of the time. Okay, you have to think about that. That's not true in general, but it is true because we're forcing n to be a multiple of p, right? So the exceptions are p in intervals of this type. So n to the one over k up to two n to the one over k for some k greater than or equal to two. And this is a very thin set of primes. Okay, and again, we only care about the, the large guys in here. So we're actually looking only for k between two and uh, I guess one over epsilon. Yeah, yeah so I could could add that in here. So the final digit and the first digit are going to be both smaller than p over two most of the time. The intermediate digits, and, and there are h of them, are the ones that are in play, so to speak. These are the ones that might be larger than p over two or smaller than p over two. We think of the probability that they're all smaller than p over two as being, let's say one over two to the power h, assuming these digits are, are somehow independent, which it, it's true if you fix p and you vary n, then these uh, events actually are independent. So heuristically, the probability that P divides two N choose N should be about one minus one over two to the H. Now comes a big assumption. Let's assume that over the different primes dividing N, the large primes, these events somehow are independent. 
So heuristically, we think of the probability that n divides 2n choose n should be roughly the product over such primes. And then 1 minus uh, this now this negative power of 2. That's just uh, minus h here. Right. So that's now a heuristic for a given n. Of course, the right side here is, is a, again, a function of n. But if we average this over n, perhaps it will give us the right answer, the, the right density. So this, of course, begs the question, how are the large prime factors of a typical integer distributed? So let's, let's first recall some, some basics about that. So I'll write the prime factors of n as p1, p2, p3 in decreasing order. The distribution of the largest one, p1, is very well known and, and is used all over the place in analytic number theory. So if we look at the asymptotic density, which I'll, I'll denote by a this d of the set for which p1 is at most a certain power of s, sorry, a certain power of n, uh, 1 over s. This is the so-called Dickman function. Okay, and uh, again, this is extremely well studied and uh, big literature on the subject. A little less well studied is the problem of the distribution of the largest k prime factors. And what we care about here is the joint distribution. So if I look at the density of the n's for which uh, p1 is at most some power of n and so on up to pk, it turns out this is something called the Poisson-Dirichlet distribution. I'll just denote it by rho sub k of s1 to sk. And this was first proved in the 1970s by Billingsley. And then later in the 90s, uh, Donnelly and Grimmett uh, simplified the analysis. And what they came up with is the following description. So I, I, now I want to describe this distribution of the largest k prime factors. And it's it's described in terms of what I call a random fragmentation process. So we start with a, an infinite sequence of independent uniform 0, 1 random variables. Okay, So these are uniformly distributed uh, real numbers between 0 and 1. If you think, just put the Haar measure on this interval. And, and that's, that's how we're sampling these. OK, so those are pretty easy to understand. And now I'm going to define a, another sequence. Okay, There's going to be actually three sequences of random variables here that have to be understood. The second one I call y1, y2, and y3, and so on. So y1 is u1. y2 is 1 minus u1 times u2. y3, 1 minus u1. 1 minus u2 times u3, and so on, following the same pattern. And I like to look at this geometrically. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the interval 0, 1, and I cut it at a random place with uniform probability. I just chop it somewhere. So this, that's this first cut. I'll keep the left-hand piece as it is. And then I look at the right-hand piece, and I chop it at a random place. So that would be this second line here. Keep the left-hand piece. That'll be y2. And if you write down the formula for it, this is the formula. And then continue the process. So take, take the, what remains, which is this right-hand part, chop it at a random place, keep the left-hand piece, call it y3 and so on and so on. So it's not really hard to see that 
as we do this, uh, almost surely this infinite sum of the yj's will equal one. That is, this process is not going to converge somewhere uh, less than one. And uh, I call that, it's like, but now it's a, it's a random fragmentation of the interval, zero, one. Okay, so if you're following so far, there's one more complication. And you can see also from this example that I wrote down that the variables y1, y2, y3, y4, and so on are tending to zero, but not necessarily monotonically. So if I then redefine, so I define now a new sequence, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and so on, which is the decreasing rearrangement of the sequence uh, of y sub i's. So again, x1 is the largest, x2 is the second largest, and so on. Now we have a, a decreasing sequence whose sum is equal to one. And it turns out that, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, okay, I'm gonna split screen this. So according to uh, the, the theorem of Billingsley and then simplified by Donnelly and Grimmett, for any K, the distribution of the first K of these is exactly the same as the distribution of the K largest prime factors of a random integer. Okay, what I, what I mean is you take a random integer up to little x and let x, little x go to infinity. Okay, and both of these have uh, then the Poisson Dirichlet distribution. And I should say, you don't have to fix K, you can let K uh, go to infinity uh, slowly with X. So Tenenbaum has some results in this direction. I'm not gonna write these down because uh, it will not be essential for my heuristic. All right. So I know this is, a, this is a lot to digest all at once, but the point is the distribution of the largest prime factors of a typical integer are known, okay? They've been known for a while. We can write down formulas for them. So let's recall then our heuristic, which says that the uh, probability of n dividing 2n choose n is given by such a product. And I want to observe something about the product. And then it depends. So this, this factor here is a function of the size of p compared with the size of n. But there's nothing here that is dependent on the ordering of these primes. I can write the primes in any order and of course the product will be the same. So in other words, it's not depending on, uh, you know, it's not some function of the largest prime multiplied by a function of the second largest prime, which might be a different function. Okay, it's the same function at all primes. So what that means is, when we're studying this particular problem, we don't have to make this decreasing rearrangement here, which is actually computationally, that's the most difficult part of the analysis. So we can stick with the uniform random variables and these y sub i's as a model for the largest prime factors of a typical integer. And so this leads to then a, oops, I seem to, okay, <laughs> trying to smoothly scroll this. So that leads to the heuristic prediction that the density of the set D0 should be C1, which I will define as the expectation of this infinite product 
where g sub j is the floor function one over yj. Okay, one over yj is now a model of the size of this ratio here, right? So we're, we're, we're flipping it. I want log n over log p. So I take the coordinate here and I uh, invert it. And uh, so I, I'm going all the way up to infinity. So we're modeling somehow all the prime factors or the sizes of all the prime factors. And it doesn't matter what order I put them in. Okay, so it doesn't matter if y1 is smaller than y2, for example. All right, now this is a nice compact notation. Uh, however, analyzing it is not terribly easy because uh, we start with uniform random variables, really nice. We form these functions of those random variables and then this complicated product. So let me just make some observations. You might wonder uh, why, why is this positive? Is it positive? And it turns out yes, and that's because the infinite product will converge rapidly. In fact, it converges extremely rapidly, uh, almost surely. Because if I look at uh, the, the y sub j is now a product of j quantities, each of which is a uniform random variable. So then if I take uh, logarithms, the, the expectation of log of a uniform random variable is minus one. And so then by the law of large numbers, g sub j is gonna be exponentially increasing with uh, high probability, actually with probability one. And therefore, this product is going to converge extremely rapidly. So this is uh, the, the, the term here is going to be doubly exponential in J. So that it, it's going to be converging extremely rapidly. So we have no, no issues there with convergence. All right. So our main theorem states that in fact, this heuristic is correct. And C1 is the density of the set D0. And numerically, uh, so I, I, we computed this in a couple different ways, which I'll discuss later. It turns out to be a little bit less than 12%. So about 11.4% 11, 11 is the uh, exact, uh, well, rough, rough uh, approximation of that. So again, uh, what's, what's the main task at hand? We have to show that for any two primes, P1 and P2, the base P1 digits of N and base P2 digits of N are somehow ind acting independently of each other. So that's the, the, the argument that needs to be made rigorous. Kevin, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. In fact, I want to flag up a question um, of Ryan's from the chat. So I, I suppose that the existence of the density is part of the of the theorem here. There's no reason. Oh yes, I yes, yes. Before before our theorem, there was no uh, result that said that the density existed, uh, or even that the lower density was positive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The lower density is a much harder question because then you have to exhibit somehow a positive density set that has uh, the right property. Now we're, we're not exhibiting it. We're doing everything through, through averaging. Okay. So uh, this is one of the main ideas in the paper is to randomly sample the prime factors of an integer in a size biased way. Now, this is one of the ideas from this paper of Donnelly and Grimmett. So let me describe it to you. And it's related to the uniform random variable uh, construction of the Poisson Dirichlet distribution, which I described earlier. So this is a, a number theoretic version of that. Right, so 
let's start with an integer that has at least k prime factors. And I'm going to successively choose a sequence of prime power divisors of n uh, with, the with the following probability distribution. So I'll first, I'll choose a prime power q1 dividing n. And the probability will be exactly this ratio for each prime power dividing, for each, uh, yeah, prime power dividing n will be the von Mongol function over log n. Okay, of course, it's a very elementary fact that the sum of these probabilities is equal to one. All right, so after q1 is chosen, I will then divide out by q1. So I'll take n over q1, and then I'll choose q2 in the same way. Specifically, I'll choose uh, for every q2 dividing n over q1, I'll choose uh, q2 with this probability, which of course, then the sum of those is equal to one. Now it's possible that I've chosen the same prime or a power of the same prime twice. If, uh, if n has, uh, is not square free, it's possible. And then I continue, I do this k times. Uh, so the last choice will be a divisor of n divided by the, the previous choices uh, with this probability. So I call this a size biased choice because it's obvious that larger primes will be chosen with higher probability than smaller primes in a, how to say, on a logarithmic scale. Now, it's a very easy exercise, in fact, uh, just, just a half a page manipulations with Merton's formula, that if I look at now these, this statistic, where I've essentially taken uh, these fractions and replace just the numerator with a logarithm. So if I look at the sequence of k fractions, that will then approach the Lebesgue measure on the intervals, or the uh, k-dimensional unit interval, unit cube. Okay. In other words, this sequence of k components behave like k independent uniform zero one random variables. Okay, so this is uh, a key idea in the Donnelly Grimmett approach to uh, discussing the, the K largest prime factors. Now, um, again, there's no guarantee that Q1 will be larger than Q2 or, or anything else. However, if this is also relatively easy to prove, if k goes to infinity slowly and epsilon goes to zero slowly and uh, the two slowly, uh, whoop, whoop, the, the rate at which epsilon goes to zero and k goes to infinity are somehow related to each other, then almost surely two things will happen. And that is q1 through qk will capture all of the largest prime factors of n. In fact, all the ones that are bigger than n to the epsilon. Okay, those are the ones we want, we care about. And secondly, none of the primes here will be terribly small. So they're all of them greater than, let's say, n to the power epsilon to the fifth. All right, there's, no, there's nothing special about five, it's just, it, any, any constant here which is large enough will, will do the trick. So what, what this is doing is it's, it's capturing all the primes we care about plus some others, which we might not care about, but none of them are terribly small. So we can, we can feed them into the heuristic and they won't have much influence. It'll just be the the product of, of numbers that are very close to one. Uh, and it, it, won't, it won't affect things too much. All right. So again, the, the details are complicated. I don't want to say too much about the proof. 
there's also the aspect of detecting when a digit of, uh, say, a, a base P digit of a number is larger than P over 2 or smaller than P over 2. So that's equivalent to uh, looking at a certain fractional part being larger than a half or less than a half. So if I look at, say, a vector of k of these fractional parts, and I want to understand how often uh, these have a prescribed behavior. Let's say uh, each one is either less than a half or greater than a half. So there's two to the k possibilities I have to study separately. And we handle that using exponential sums. Uh, again, it's we have to be careful because I want k to go to infinity slowly. So it's important that these exponential sums be uh, completely uniform, right? So we had to work a little bit on that aspect. Okay, so the, the, what you should take away from this is that our techniques are a combination of, let's say, harmonic analysis methods and this, what, what I call from here uh, uh, anatomical cons uh, considerations, that is the distribution of the largest prime factors of integers. So it was very convenient for us that uh, this distribution was, uh, I how to say, very nice, because it, it fit right in with these exponential sum estimates, All right? So I don't want to say too much about that. So using the same methods, we can uh, study the integers n for which a given power of n divides 2n choose n. So for any positive integer l, this quantity is also uh, has positive density which will depend on L, of course. And uh, obviously, these constant CL are, are, are decreasing. Uh, so here is what you would expect from the heuristic for the uh, probability that a random number has this property. And we, in fact, are able to prove that. So. Uh, this sum on h is the new part, but this is simply telling us how often we have uh, fewer than l uh, digits, which are larger than p over 2. So we're looking now for at least, instead of at least one digit that's bigger than p over 2, we need at least l of them. So we subtract off the, the opposite case, which we have uh, at most l minus 1 of them that are small. And moreover, in this paper, we provide an asymptotic formula for C sub L when L goes to infinity. I should say that there is a great deal of computations uh, done for this problem when L is between 1 and 12. I think all of those sequences appear on the OEIS. Um, then, and there's been a lot of effort done to compute them. Um, so heuristically, and I'll give you a rough idea of why C sub L should be roughly the Dickman function of 2L. So why, why 2L? Well, look at this quantity here, this, this sum. So uh, the sum multiplied by 2 to the 1 minus gj is the probability that if you have L, sorry, you have uh, g sub j minus 1, uh, random coin flips, it's the probability that you have at most L minus 1 of them that come up heads. So of course, if you have uh, substantially fewer than 2 L of these, then this, uh, you will be deficient most of the time. So this sum will end up being 1, and for such uh, so that means there'll be a factor in here, which is very close to zero. And that corresponds to the existence of 
a prime which is bigger than n to the one over two L. On the other hand, if all the factors, if all the primes are smaller than n to the one over two L, then G sub J is larger than, uh, substantially larger than two L, then this factor is close to zero. Again, just standard binomial distribution, all right? We're, we're comparing, we have two plus epsilon L coin flips and I wanna understand how often we'll have uh, fewer than L of them coming up ahead. So that's very rare. Again, a law of large numbers is, is sufficient to explain this. Okay, so I hope that was uh, roughly understandable. We, in fact, in our paper, we, we come up with uh, an exact asymptotic for C sub L in, in terms of the Dickman function. It's two L and then there are some other terms that uh, have to be added, but I won't say anything more about the details there. Uh, one final result, which is somewhat opposite in spirit from the others. This was a, a problem posed, I think by Sana in a paper a few years ago. So how often is n and two n choose n relatively prime? Okay, so again, very opposite problem. So we show that that's asymptotic to a certain constant times x over log x. The constant is given, uh, here I can give it very explicitly. Uh, and it turns out to be a, a little bit more than 1.5. So here, I'll let, let me talk about one particular uh, subsequence of n's for which this holds, and that's the prime. So any odd prime will have this property. Okay, so uh, because 2n choose n, if you look at how the, the prime behaves there, the, the prime There'll be uh, two copies up here and two copies in the denominator, they exactly cancel. So it, that prime won't divide two n choose n. And in fact, most of the numbers that have this property are divisible only by large prime factors. Again, using this lemma that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, that two n choose n is always or almost always divisible by small prime powers. Uh, so that restricts n to be a product of only large ones. So that explains at least the order of magnitude here. And uh, for each k, the, the corresponding term here, which is this complicated multidimensional integral, that's exactly the contribution from n that have k prime factors. So for example, when k is equal to one, this whole thing collapses to just the number one. When k is two, it's relatively easy to compute it to as many decimals as you want. It's a little bit more than uh, a half. Uh, so this function h of u uh, comes from a heuristic, which is similar to the heuristic I presented for the, uh, the D0 set. Uh, again, there's this floor function in the exponent. So this part here is, is, is uh, relatively easy to see, it's the same, it comes up in the same way that uh, it did in the other heuristic. Okay, and uh, last thing I wanna do is say a few words about how we computed these constants. So we did it via Laplace transforms, not surprising because this is how one uh, analyzes the Dickman function or smooth numbers, okay, following the, the Hildebrandt Tenenbaum method. So there's an explicit formula as an inverse Laplace transform. Uh, so it, it, th there is an infinite sum here, uh, and that's to take care of this, this fractional part business uh, in terms of this well known, well studied entire function called the E1 function. So using this and some numerical packages, uh, so MP math is a Python package for doing multi-precision math. I think that's how, what it stands for. 
Uh, unfortunately, the inverse Laplace transform function seemed a bit numerically unstable. So if, we, if you run it with 100 digit precision, it'll give you some answer. Run it with 200 digit precision. The difference between those two, uh, they, they differed in the eighth decimal place, which made us a little bit queasy as far as uh, believing the answers. So I also ran a computation of C1 and some of the others using a Monte Carlo method. So remember, C1 uh, can be written as the expectation of a certain product of random variables, which come from uniform random variables. So I was able to do some uh, numerical approximations, uh, again, just taking uh, random numbers uh, in the computer and computing that, that product. Uh, and, and they agreed at least to several decimal places. So that, that 0.114, uh, so I'm, I'm, we're pretty confident about at least the first three or four digits here um, on the number. But again, uh, we didn't try to perform any super rigorous uh, analysis uh, on, on this, uh, this constant. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I have.